Hello and welcome back to the channel. This is Ignu B A P C H. This channel is dedicated to Ignu B A Psychology honors. So whether you are starting a new journey with Ignu, seeking an exam revision, or maybe a little clarification on some topic, this channel it's for you. If you are watching us for the first time, thank you, and uh, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you won't lose us to the never-ending feed on YouTube. This series is about BPCC 102, that is biopsychology. Today's video is the second part of the first chapter, introduction to biopsychology. We will be discussing various methods that are used to study the brain and its function. Okay, so let's begin. The previous video on biopsychology gave you an idea about what biopsychology is and its divisions. If you haven't watched it yet, go check it out. We have shared the link in the description box below. Now let's talk about how scientists study the human brain. The brain structure is complex, as we all know, and understanding how it works is a big challenge. Scientists they have found out different parts of the brain have different jobs. For example, they discovered that a part called Broca's area is related to speaking. In the 1800s, a neurologist named Paul Broca. He noticed that when a patient couldn't speak, they had damage in a specific area in the front left part of the brain. More patients with speech problem also had damage in that same area, which is now known as Broca's area. This research showed that brain damage can affect things like hunger and emotions. So let's explore the main methods scientists use to study the brain. So first of all, we'll discuss about the evaluation method. It sounds complex, but it's basically about carefully removing the part of a brain to see what actually happens. So both ablation and lesions method involve cutting a part of the brain to learn more. With ablation, they don't just cut; they also destroy a bit of a brain tissue. Then they see how behavior changes because of this. Think of it like solving a puzzle by removing a piece. Okay. Now the area we remove is called a lesion. Okay. It's like a kind of a little brain injury. It's all about understanding how brain works. Okay, so you might wonder why would anyone want to do that? Well, it helps scientists figure out what different parts of the brain do. But it's not as simple as cutting things out. See, uh, the brain's region they work together like a team. So if you take one out, it might affect its teammates nearby. You know, so creating a lesion in one spot might cause a ripple effect. Plus. Sometimes the brain is like a superhero, compensating for the loss by shifting tasks to the other areas. Now let's talk techniques. There are different ways to create these brain lesions. One method is called aspiration. It's like using a super thin needle to suck away a tiny bit of a brain tissue. Another technique it's radio frequency. It uses heat to create a change in the brain area being studied. And there's also knife cuts where careful slices are made with a special tool. Then comes cryogenic blockhead, a bit like temporarily hitting pause button on the specific brain cell by cooling them down. How cool is that? And guess what? Even knock poisons are used to cause control damage to certain areas. But it's not as scary as it sounds. These techniques might sound like sci-fi, but they help us unlock the brain secret piece by piece. So that was ablation, removing a part of a brain to see how the brain functions in overall. Okay, so let's move on to the second method, that is histological method. Imagine you want to know really tiny details about the brain's tissues, like looking it under a super microscope. There's where histological method comes in. You take a little piece of a brain and treat it, so it can be placed in a slide and looked at under a special microscope. You see, brain tissue is really delicate and can easily fall apart. So here is a procedure to it. So we need to fix it and give it some color to make it pop up. You know, to show better. So there is a procedure you to do it. Okay. First up, there's fixation. This is like giving the brain piece a bath in something called a fixative. Okay. One common fixative is formalin. This makes the tissue a bit harder, but it's not rock hard. Okay. So the second procedure, we freeze it up. Okay. Yeah, just like food, we dip it in a sugar solution, put it in a freezer, and control the temperature to make it just right. Once it's nice and solid, we are ready for the next step. That's embedding. It's covered with paraffin or nutrocellulose. Now it's time to slice it up. 
this is where microtome a fancy slicing machine comes in okay the slices are placed in a slide sort of like a microscope sandwich we use albumin which is egg stuff to hold them in place now we have got our slides with slices but they are not colorful yet remember we discussed it so staining is the final touch it's like adding color to a black and white photo we use different stains to make certain parts stand out nacelle stain gives color to cell bodies myelin stain helps us to you know see the nerve pathways by coloring the myelin sheath okay so third one is psychophysiological recording methods all right let's talk about how we look into what's happening inside our heads or how our bodies respond without inserting anything in there okay so first up we got electroencephalography or eeg for short it records the brain electrical activities using a machine eeg machine so few electrodes are placed on the scalp and they catch the brain signals so and back in the day they used paper that rolled out now it's all on the computer this helps diagnose brain troubles mild mild head injuries epilepsies and even how memory changes as we age okay another one is meg magnetoencephalography with meg we can see how the brain's magnetic fields the change on the outside of our head now another one is uh, electromyography emg have you ever wondered how muscles work well emg helps us understand that we put sensors on the skin over muscles to measure how they move and tense up another one is eog electroculography eog it helps us study eye movement by putting small sensor near the eyes we can see how they move around okay the last one is electrodermal activity this method lets us measure how sweaty our skin gets when we feel emotions okay tiny sensor on tiny sensors on our fingers they tell us how our skin responds to different situations okay so these methods teach us a lot about how bodies you know our bodies without poking or prodding them too much the fourth one let's talk about electrical stimulation imagine we could use tiny electric signals to learn how different parts of our brain work when we stimulate the brain with electricity it reacts and creates changes in its activity these changes can make us behave differently depending on which part of the brain we stimulate to do this we use special tools called electrodes there are two types micro and macro so micro electrodes which are like super thin metal wires and macro electrodes may are made of stronger wires we place them on our scalp or even inside the brain to record how our group of nerve cells called tracts are working together okay so we can use these electric signals over time either for a long period as an animal recovers from a surgery that's called chronic recording or for a specific purpose when we are focusing on a particular nerve pathway that is acute recording so these signals are then shown on screen imagine like a uh, oscilloscope like a visual representation of sound wave it helps us see the brain's activity pattern then there is ink writing oscilloscope also called a polygraph which uses needles to draw the brain signal on a rolling paper with ink this technique is called electroencephalogram it's helpful in spotting brain issues like tumors epilepsy or studying sleep patterns and guess what modern technology even uses computers to store analyze and display all these inf incredible informations now let's go on the fifth method it's chemical stimulation chemical stimulation ways we can use chemicals to trigger the brain activities and create effects we can introduce drugs into the body through injections or tubes directly or to the stomach or veins these chemicals interact with the brain's chemistry and we can use various techniques to understand what's happening one method involves using a radioactive drug called 2 deoxyglucose 2 dg which is injected into an animal after it's absorbed by the brain we can examine the slices of the brain tissue by coating these slices and developing them like photographs we can see black spots that show how neurons have interacted with the drug okay? another cool technique is cerebral dialysis where we place a tube in animal's brain as the animal goes about its activities we collect and analyze the neurochemicals that are released and there's also in vivo voltammetry where the brain's chemical release during activities are studied 
okay so it's like uh, more like a signing a light on the specific places where the brain's chemical messenger work the sixth one is stereotactic liaison now imagine we want to study really small parts deep inside the brain but it's too risky or too tricky to remove them completely in this case researchers use a special method first they figure out exactly which part of the brain they want to study okay then they use a special atlas to find the right spot let's understand how it works with animal okay they use a device to hold the animal's head steady like a headrest with everything in place they carefully remove a tiny electrode or tube into the brain this electrode can stay there for a while to gather information and when the research is done the animal is given anesthesia again the electrode is taken out so it's like a little adventure to learn more about so the seventh part is neuroimaging imagine having a camera that can capture the hidden secrets of the brain okay that's exactly what neuroimaging does it's a bunch of techniques that lay scientists take an image inside the brain so one of the method is x-ray imaging you know how x-rays can show broken bones right well they can also give us a look into the brain structure this helps doctors spot things like tumors or injuries then there's ct scan which is like a bunch of x-ray taken from different angles creating 3d picture of a brain it's like making a puzzle out of pictures so ct scan are useful for figuring out if somebody needs surgery or other treatments this is great for spotting things like blood clots or injuries now let's talk about mri which stands for magnetic resonance imaging this one's like a high tech camera that uses magnets to create detailed images of the brain it's great for finding problems deep inside the brain and gives us a closer look than x-rays pet scan on the other hand they show us how the brain is working there is a special kind of injection to light up activities part of the brain here the brightest light shows the busiest brain area during different tasks lastly we have fmri short for functional mri it's like a detective that investigate changes in blood flow okay active brain areas they need more blood so fmri helps us see which part of the brain are active during task or thoughts okay this is super helpful for understanding how the brain process information and why it behaves the way it does so the final one it's a neuropsychological assessment so when someone has a brain injury okay and the scientists they want to understand how it affects their behavior and thinking so this is where neuropsychological assessment comes in imagine it like a series of tests okay that helps us understand how well different parts of the brain are working okay this test cover a lot of things like memory learning thinking decision making language and more they are given to a person and their answers are scored and evaluated this gives us a complete picture of how their brain is doing okay it's like putting puzzles pieces together to see the whole picture over this assessment don't uh, just diagnose the problem they also plan the treatment we can see if the treatment is working by reassessing later okay so well now uh, there are different types of tests available for this assessment some common are you know uh, westler intelligence scale this is like a brain performance test that measures how smart someone is it is used for adults and kids of different ages another one is hall state rate and neuropsychological test battery this battery of tests checks everything from thinking skill to motor functions it's like checking different parts of the is like checking different aspects of a machine to make sure it's working smoothly okay another is luria nebraska neuropsychological battery this set of test helps find problem in different areas like memory language and intelligence okay it's like looking at all the pieces of the puzzle to find out what's actually missing okay so uh the other one is delis kaplan executive functional test this test is like checking a person's thinking skills and decision making abilities it is useful for understanding brain's executive functions okay so those are the methods so this is the end of the video let's uh, recap quickly today we discussed about the methods to study the brain there were eight yeah can you name them okay let's start ablation histological method psychophysiological recording methods electrical stimulation chemical stimulation stereotactic liaison neuroimaging and neuropsychological assessment yeah now uh, in the next part of the video we will bring you the second chapter in bpcc 102 this is the end of the first chapter don't forget to uh, check the first part okay we'll leave the link on the description down below 
and thank you for watching i hope you liked the video don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button below for more content in the future and follow us on instagram for quick notes and updates join the discussion on telegram for all your questions links are down below in the description see you in the next video until then stay curious stay engaged and remember you got this